your jingle. There you go. <laughs> I love that. I don't know what. I don't know what the hell. Ever, you know, whatever. That's what came uh, out. My wife singing stuff. that close harmony stuff. Uh, you know, it was like a chord melody guitar thing on voc put onto vocals. But whatever. Oh, anyway, Brandon, stuff. thanks so much for um, for getting together. I know a lot of people are interested in in what you're doing, and the, a lot of people have heard their favorite players play your stuff. But it's really nice for you to take the time. And it's a real privilege to pick your brains because there's a lot of a lot of stuff you can read. You don't know how to process a lot of the things you read. So it'd be great to talk to you knowing that, you know, you get the results. <laughs> well, thanks for <laughs> thanks for having me. You know, for, to myself, I'm just a guy in sweatpants who solders all day. Um, so well, it's, it's... yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just a guy in pajamas who practices the guitar all the time. I'm waiting exactly. to be... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks, I mean, for, I, thanks for having me. No, thank you very much. So um, I guess the first question I should ask you is, could you give us a little history of, you know, how you got in, got to where you're at now? Wait, how did you arrive at this point? Wow. Um, from the beginning or from yeah, music? You know, or... Yeah, yeah, music. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I, I was always the kid who took his toys apart, um, you know, tried, try, you know, when they break, I'd take them apart, see if I could fix them. And, you know, one day I sort of found myself able to put things back together. And, you know, we, we fast forward, you know, I picked up guitar around, I don't know, 11 or so. And uh, I took some lessons from a, a local great. And, um, you know, this guy's name was Paul Parker. I'm not even sure if he's still around. He was a uh, he was an older gentleman when I was 12. So I don't know if he's still around, but just great, you know, uh, traditional Americana jazz kind of player. And so we kind of fast forward uh, and I get, I got heavy into uh, guitar gear. I worked in music stores. I just loved gear, toys and things like that. And I, of course, he, you know, you hear a lot of music and, and I was playing in a band. This was probably late nineties, like 90, eight or so playing in a band with a friend of mine and uh, there was just this sound that I had in my head that I wanted for my guitar and I could never find it and I bought and sold you know I worked at a music store so I had access to just tons of stuff um and uh I bought and sold probably 10 different rigs in the course of a year looking for this sound and pedals and vintage stuff and new stuff and all this you know, and one night after band practice, we're sitting around, we ordered some pizzas, we we're going to hang out and, you know, just talk about band and, you know, just kind of hang out after band practice. And uh, my buddy Bob puts on a CD and I immediately just stopped. What is that? What is that sound? That's what I'm looking for. That is the sound in my head. He says, oh, that's Robin Ford. And uh, <clears throat> I said, well, what's he what's he use what gets that sound he says oh that's a dumble i said well where do you get who sells those i've never even you know i've never even seen one in a store i of course read about them in interviews with eric johnson and stevie ray vaughn and guitar magazines and things like that but never really gave it another thought just thought it was just a you know just another piece of you know another piece of gear out there um and uh he said, well, you can't really get one. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you kind of got to like be somebody or know somebody to get one of those. And I said, well, shoot, I'm not anybody and I don't know anybody. <laughs> so I set out on the uh, rarely primitive internet of the time uh, looking to find one to buy. You know, you hear, you heard about people at the time finding strats and Les Pauls from the 50s and 60s under people's beds that, you know, give me what I paid for it. It was 250 you know, and uh, I thought, I'm going to find myself one of these dumbbells. And I did find one and it was 12 grand, oh, which, you yeah. know, in, in retrospect, well, yeah, that was a ton of money in like back in the day. Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was a ton of money. But in retrospect, I mean, it's mm -hmm. worth, you know, well over a hundred plus now. So, <laughs> you know, I was like, well, you know, I could have scraped it together, but I was in my twenties, you know, there 12 grand was in a, the most I'd ever spent on an amp. And we're talking about like, at the time, like pristine vintage black bass fenders was about 1200 bucks, right. you know, at the time, 1200 bucks bought you a pristine super reverb. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could get a beater for about 700. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and in my search, I actually found a fellow um, that uh, had a little blog about making his own dumble. 
uh, he lived in Japan. Um, we're still friends to this day. He's a wonderful guy, uh, instrumental in what I do, really. Um, and uh, he had some, you know, some sort of rudimentary schematics and things like that. And um, just sort of the process. And I, of course, had never done anything like that, you know, soldered something together. I mean, I built like a, you know, <sighs> something from Radio Shack or something, you know, they used to sell little kits to, you know, but nothing like a guitar amplifier. And I found a schematic and I printed it out and I looked at it and I said, you know, this all fits on one piece of paper. I have no idea what any of this means, but it all fits on one sheet of paper. It can't be that complicated. <clears throat> I got in my car and I drove to Barnes and Noble, which is, um, you know, what we had before Amazon, a bookstore. And uh, they were open till um, about 11 at the time. I think they were open till 11 or 1030. And I walked in two, two minutes before the bell and ran back to the technical section and bought a book on basic electricity and took it home and started reading and uh, bought every book I could find on tube amplifiers, uh, you know, vintage electronics. I talked to anybody who would talk to me, any of the old guys that were still around that used to do this when it's all there was. Um, you know, we had a great local resource uh, here in Denver, a uh, guy who goes by the name of Lord Valve, um, his name's Willie to his friends. Um, but he gave me a lot of great information and he made me earn it. You know, he would, he, you know, if I asked him a stupid question, he wouldn't give me the answer. He'd tell me to go find the answer, you know, and I'd come back to him and having found the answer. And, you know, that's kind of how I learned electronics. You can't go to electronics school and learn about tubes. You know, the section on tubes is a page about this long. So this is a vacuum tube. It kind of works like this. This is what they used to use onto transistors. And, and so, you know, you kind of have to dig and find old manuals and things like that. And then it was just a matter of, starting to put stuff together and learning the solder techniques and, um, you know, the right kind of stuff to use. And, you know, there was some trial and error and, uh, you know, I did, I did a lot of, you know, service for buddies just to, just to get my, my feet wet. You know, I didn't really charge them, but for the parts and, you know, I'd recap their, their old fenders or whatever, just, just for practice. And, you know, when I felt confident, I, I started building a couple of amplifiers and, you know, eventually worked up, you know, through a series of simpler builds to the, you know, the sort of overdrive special uh, type of build. And, um, you know, the rest is kind of history. I, I built one for a fellow that I met on the internet trying to buy something from him, actually. And it, it was just the weirdest happenstance. We just got to talk and, he, you know, and he says, you know, I really want somebody to put me together a Dumble. And I said, well, you know, I'm trying to do that for myself. And I said, you know, if you'll, if you'll buy me a set, he was telling me about these fancy transformers that he liked. And I said, you know, if you'll send me a set of those transformers and pay for the cost of parts, I'll put the amp together for you. Because wow. I wanted to cut my teeth. I just wanted to learn how to do it. And I did. And I sent it to him. And, uh, you know, he liked it. And um, years later, I'm on the, uh, what used to be the T-Rec forum, which is now called, I think, the Amp Garage. Uh, I haven't been on for a while. It was the Amp Garage last time I was I was there. Um, I think it's still the Amp Garage. Um, but it was originally the T-Rec Forum, and we started talking about Dumbles one day, and and um, <clears throat> they uh, eventually split the forum into two sections, you know, Train Rack and Dumble, and it became mm -hmm. the Amp Garage. And, and the uh, the guy, uh, a guy who owns that amplifier, posted a picture of it, that one that I built, and he said. You know, I picked this up at a used guitar store. I love it. I have no idea about it or who built it or anything like that. And uh, I sent the guy a message and just said, hey, you know, I actually built that. I'm so happy that you like it so much. And uh, <clears throat> he sent me a message back. Can you build more? I said, well, sure. And before I knew it, I was in business, like wow. just just that fast. Like yeah. I had no intention. I just wanted one for myself. Wow. You know, I never I never started this to be in business. You know, I, I, I had not a, a fine job when I started doing this and um the uh uh you know it was just the excitement of you know people really like something that I made and you know so I started doing it and tried to get better and better and you know I have a friend locally that you know has a few uh overdrive specials and 
was kind enough to let me borrow them and compare and kind of poke through them. And, you know, I uh, actually, you know, have serviced them since uh, for him and, you know, kept them in good running order. And, you know, word kind of got out there and people started sending me their, their, their dumbbells for service. Um, and I'm happy to service them. Uh, you know, it's, it's always cool to see a new one and they're all different. Um, every single one, uh, I think I've had 35 across my bench, uh, over the years, right. um, varying pedigrees and, and, uh, you know, um, you know, some are, some are famous, uh, some are very famous and, you know, some are just folks who bought one and just enjoy them. And, and, uh, it's, it's always fun to get in there and service them. There's always something new. There's always something different that he did for somebody. And, yeah. You know, part of what I do is almost like archaeology, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, trying to, trying to sort of decipher eras and parts and things like that. And what goes with what? And, um, you know, it's, it, it's a lot of fun. You know, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Um, and uh <clears throat> You know, what, what can you say? I mean, I, I work from home. I, I wear sweatpants. I build guitar amplifiers and, uh, you know, nobody yells at me. <laughs> it's, the best, it's the best job. You made it. You made it. No, that's, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. Wow. Man, I can only, I can only aspire to that situation. Nobody yelling at me, but yeah. yeah. I know. Right. Yeah. Nobody yells at me. Even it's amazing. Even, even when I deserve it, they don't yell at me. <laughs> so here's a question. I mean, this is this is. It, let me. I'll just say it. One thing I want to ask you: Did Dumble get it wrong at all? Now, I, I, I as, as I've said to you, you know, and our correspondent, I don't know anything about anything. So I'm the most ignorant. Did he golfer. get it wrong? Is there well, any first thing you think? Why did he do that? Um, there's always a reason. Everything, everything in there is done with an intention, I right. believe. And you know, the cool thing about about his amplifiers is, is there's a lot of not necessarily found things, but um, there's a lot of things like military surplus. And, you know, um, there's uh, a fellow told me uh, that there's, uh, he, he knows Alexander. I've, I've never met Alexander. I, I'd love to chat with him. I, I truly admire his creations, but um, I doubt he wants to talk to me. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's almost like a, a high form of driftwood sculpture. You know, um, there's, there's just interesting things in all, all of them. And, um, you know, transformers from various things. And there's something from Radio Shack, apparently, in every single one of them. Um, huh. And uh, yeah, yeah, just, you know, off the shelf parts. You know, uh, people have said that off the shelf parts, but there are, there's a lot of, you know, what we call blister pack parts, which, you know, back when there were, you know, electronic stores, um, <laughs> you know, uh, you'd go in and there'd, there'd be a wall full of resistors and they'd be in these little square packs with, you know, five or six resistors in it and a little plastic bubble holding it in place. And we call those blister pack parts. And it's, it's kind of neat to watch the evolution because, you know, in the, in the earlier days, you see um, real early, you see like, you know, carbon comp resistors and some of the the Piker, uh, you know, carbon film resistors, and then uh, the next era of blister pack was Sprague. So we start seeing the Sprague blister pack parts, which were called um, Q line, um, and then uh, you know that that kind of stopped, and we see ECG, which sort of became NTE, which were sourced from all kinds of different places. Um, and uh, so you know, there's there's always just a mismatch of different things in there. Um, and they all sound a little different because of it. You know, I, 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 as far as what he got wrong, that's a hard thing to say. You know, you could, you could argue customer service, but then again, you have, you have somebody who didn't necessarily want to be in big business, you know, who takes what he does very personally. Um, and you know, he doesn't suffer fools. So I don't know that he got anything wrong. I mean, the guy's amps are worth a hundred, you know, one hundred and fifty, hundred and eighty thousand dollars. And some of the most beautiful guitar tones come out of those. They're well, yeah. I mean, what did he get thing. wrong? Nothing. Well, I'm I not surprised. Think, I mean, he surprised. created. He created. You can't have it. You know, um, <laughs> he really did. I mean, the the whole reason that they're as expensive as they are is not because they're made out of some sort of 
gold components or you know anything esoteric like that it's because you can't have it and so it creates a lore and it creates a, a, a mystique around them and and and, and an excitement you know um when when I played my first real one, it was cool. But um, you know, uh, I played a few that weren't that cool, and I played some that made the hair on my arm stand up. You know, uh, and and they're 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 different for every player. You know, whoever ordered one. Um, you know, I understand that there's a there's an interview process, and you have to meet with him, and um, you know, he he won't build one for just anyone. You know, right. me, I'm. <clears throat> you know <laughs> I'll, I'll, i don't care you know <laughs> i mean i'm happy to you know uh, anybody gets my best work you know i'm um, gonna start a penny jar in the corner of my studio i'm gonna get cracking on that every time i got to see the tones uh, in my pocket I'm, I'm gonna get cracking on this yeah well you know it's it's funny if 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 uh you know, if I would have been able to get one when I was thinking about wanting one, I would have never started doing what I do. You know, it was, uh, I mean, I, I saw the price tag on those. I thought never, you know, mm -hmm. never would mm -hmm. I be able to do that. So, you know, I just go about it like I've always gone about things that are beyond, you know, <laughs> make my own. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, what the hell is that FET input thing all about? That's how little I know. So, um, so what that is, is um, the, the FET input is a little preamp, um, it's a little board about yay big, and uh, it has one uh, JFET on it, which is a transistor, a uh, junction field effect transistor. And it's a high impedance input. I, I strongly believe, and, and I've never confirmed this, but um, it's so similar to uh, the old Barkus Berry hot dot box. I believe it to be actually a preamp for the old dot style piezo pickups. Right. And I, I, I don't know this for absolute certain, but it sort of makes sense. You know, um, you, you take a guy like uh, David Lindley who played with Jackson Brown, okay? Mm -hmm. And David played, uh, you know, some guitar and he played some uh, lap steel and he played a little bit of fiddle and different things. And I, I just can't imagine, you know, at the time in the seventies, there was no such thing as like an onboard EQ, you know, maybe in its infancy in like a, an ovation guitar or something. I, I, I haven't dug that far into it, but a lot of people would use the stick on pickups to amplify their acoustic guitars and they plug it into the little high impedance preamp with about a three meg input. And that FET input has a three, a 3.3 meg input, just like one of those little hot dot boxes it's a little bit of a simplified circuit, but it works pretty well for that purpose. When you plug your regular magnetic pickups into it, it acts like a little tiny bit of a boost. Just add some hair and some grit. It sounds nice. Yeah. Um, certain circuits, it sounds better than others, uh, in my opinion. Um, but, uh, you know, like David Lindley, he, he always plugs into the uh, FET, uh, mm -hmm. or at least he said so in that interview he did with uh, Ben Harper. Um, and they both use the FET, you know, whereas like uh, Larry, his you know his dumbbells had it taped off uh, his blutos i just put a hole plug there i didn't even put it on his amps right um so uh different different guys like it it's it's just an extra sound that's there it's it's right. available to use um i can make it foot switchable on my amplifiers for people who like to be able to turn it on and off like it's really popular on like my 70s voice amp which is sort of that you know that that 70s era you know late 70s era uh, style and the FET sounds really nice with that circuit and it gives you wow. that screaming David Lindley running on empty you know that that great uh, lap steel solo on running yeah. on empty yeah, yeah. like that's that's what gives you that sound is plugging into that FET input right um, it just adds just a little bit of grit and lo-fi and it's noisy and it's wonderful you know <laughs> it's, you know it's got it's got warts but it's great Oh, fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I got a terrible, I have to make a terrible confession. It's like, uh, it's weighing on me. I was doing a, a trade show in China, uh, uh -huh. playing for this French guitar company that I've got a, an arrangement with. And I was wandering around as you do at those things, like my head pounding from the noise. And I saw in the corner what was obviously a Dumble clone. Uh -huh. I thought, I didn't have great hopes. And I plugged into this thing. And it was, I was playing a relic strat that the guy had on the stand. 
and he was a, a steel string singer knockoff and mm -hmm. he had the blue carpet thing and i thought nah. and i plugged into this thing and it was pretty really very very good and i had to good. Look at the picture i was doing, doing some research i was thinking one of these days that i would like one of those kind of amps you know an sss mm -hmm. kind of sure um, but um i'd found a photo from when i was playing this up and it, and it was the fet input i was in i thought i've got to remember that got to. <laughs> it was, you know, for, well, for you know that, was... that circuit um that circuit runs on nine volts like a battery um oh. you know you could like they could be built into a pedal i would imagine there's probably people out there who make it a pedal. well it's funny you should say that there's um there's a japanese company called shins music that make um pedals yeah pedals. Uh -huh. you know those guys shins are, are yeah great uh -huh. And yeah, um, yeah, there's something in the works. Yeah, a pedal. I, maybe I yeah, should it's, it's a it's a simple circuit. I mean, um, my little cord that I use in the amp, it, it's it's configured to work in an amplifier, so it's kind of big. I mean, I put it into like a uh, phase 100 size box. It doesn't really fit in the little, you know, the little like the phase 90 style box like yeah. most pedals are in. Yeah. Um, but it it's a simple circuit. It could be reworked. I mean, it's 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 one transistor. I mean, it's right. as simple as something like a fuzz face or, yeah, yeah. you know, I think there's, I think there's four capacitors and I don't know, less than 10 resistors. There's not much to it right. Um, right. At, at all. So it's, it's a cool sounding little circuit, you know, um, yeah. it, it does what it, it does what it says and it says what it does. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, I tell you what, your, um, uh, your high plains drifter amp. Oh man. I'm going to have to put a few more pounds in that jar. In <laughs> there's, a, there's a demo on the on the internet of a young lad playing it, and damn, what a sound! I mean, wow. Yeah, they're they're massive. I mean, they're, yeah. it's a huge amplifier. It Every. really is. And it they're heavy. Um, they have big transformers in them. Uh, 100, 100 pounds in the flight case. One of those ways. Um, 70, 70 pounds just for the head. Wow. Uh, that's what 30, 32, 33 kilos, I guess. Wow. There. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And a kilo is two, a kilo is 2.2 pounds, isn't it? Uh, don't get tired. You, you, you don't know because you, you, you just I'm, deal I'm, with metrics. I just do this all the time. I, I don't know anything about anything. I'm spending all my time worrying about what notes go with what It's heavy. You know? it's, 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 it's a heavy. two person job. Yeah, it's yeah. a two person job to move. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's heavy. I'm still, uh -huh. I'm still obsessing about that. But, um, um, I guess for the people that, that really know your stuff, I guess they when they, I don't think anybody really needs to to be talked through. But I'd be interested if you could, if you don't mind, giving us a little rundown of the the different models that you do. Is, is that okay? Uh, I can go chronologically. Yeah, if you don't mind, please. Uh, yeah. So uh, I do the the '70s era, um, which is a little bit more akin to a hot rodded Fender. Right. Um, you know, very tight bass response kind of raw sounding they're they're a lot of fun to play very dynamic uh yep. one of my favorites uh that's your your david lindley kind of sound your uh little george kind of sound mm -hmm. um the next evolution of the circuit uh we call the classic um it still has that sort of familiar fendery dip uh in the upper mids um that's more like your uh, oh carlos rios or um Oh, Steve Ferris from Mr. Mister, I believe his amp is, is a classic. Uh, it's uh, the, you know, the Larry Carlton last night, Robin Ford talked to your daughter-ish kind of sound. Okay. It's mm -hmm. fatter. Uh, it's, it's uh, the bass goes from snappy and percussive to very friendly and pillowy. Um, it, 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 it is that quintessential, hey, that's a dumble sound. Um, yeah. The next evolution of the circuit is is the skyline, and that's the one that people normally associate with, like the Robin Ford sound. Um, <clears throat> that one has a little bit tighter low end than the classic, and it's got a more pronounced mid range. Um, it's smoother into the treble frequencies, um, so uh, it's you know it's that it's that ultra smooth. Hey, that's a dumble sound. Yeah. Um, then we get into the HRM amplifiers, the hot rubber monkey amplifiers. Uh, those are starting about, I don't know, 89, 90, somewhere in there. Um, and those actually have a second set of tone controls inside on the overdrive. 
um, they have separate master volumes um, versus the earlier, you know, the classic and the Skyline had uh, what was called a ratio control for the overdrive. It was sort of like a blend, how much of it. And then there was a master volume globally for the whole amp. When we get into the HRM, now each channel has its own separate master volume, which is a really nice move. I mean, it makes balancing the channels much easier. Wow. Uh, but they take on a little bit more of an aggressive sound. Uh, they're more partially sort of sound. A little bit more martially. They're yeah, more touch sensitive. Right. Um, but uh, they're also a little bit more aggressive. Uh, right. Great, great amplifiers. I mean, the, the few I've played from that amp, from little, wow. <clears throat> the few I've played from that era um, <laughs> have, have been really nice amplifiers. Right. Um, and then uh, the next evolution is, is we, he goes kind of more tweed uh, influenced after that. We've got the, uh, the Blues Master, the Ripper, and uh, Ultraphonics uh, circuits. And they, um, they have a new output section. You know, the, the other ones had what was referred to as the precision power amp, okay? Um, <clears throat> the, the later ones, uh, or the more recent ones, I should say, have something called a tone blossom output section, which is very similar to like a tweed basemen or a, a high power twin, uh, the output section in that. It's got a lot less negative feedback. It, it, it drives a little harder. Um, I like it a lot. Some guys really don't like it because it's it's not as smooth as the the circuits from the mid '80s. Those are the ones that are really like chocolate milkshake smooth. Um, the you know it, it, they get a little bit more gritty and and growly uh, the, the more recent we go. And I don't know what he's been working on recently. I I would say probably the most recent thing of his I've seen was from about 2006. So you know 15 years ago. Uh, I hear he's still building stuff, um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, for for top name players and and uh, renting his his services, uh, you know, to studios and things like that. Which right. you know, how how cool is that? You know, you pay Dumble for a day, and he shows up with a bunch of his you know super secret amplifiers, and you get to oh, record cool. with them. Oh yeah, that, that's pretty cool. You know, I mean, it's a piece of history. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, speaking of uh, him making for for famous people. Uh, did you say you, you're making an app for Carlos Santana? Yeah, uh, I've made a I've made a few for Carlos. He actually no, has his own he has his own model um, that's just right. for him. Yeah, right. it's called the Universal Tone, and uh, the only person who can buy a Budo Tone Universal Tone is Carlos Santana. Um, <laughs> everybody, every everybody else who wants that amp, it's called a Ronin. Um, yeah. But right. yeah, the, the the Universal Tone logo is is specific for Carlos. Oh, I mean, he's 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 great. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, I've, I've got I've you know I've gotten a chance to 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 sit and talk with him here and there, and I mean, he's he's just as cool as you think he'd be. Oh, you know, just, yeah, just I'm not surprised. Super mellow, just just cool, and 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 his wife Cindy is awesome. Oh, um, she's a great player too. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Great drummer, but but yeah. she's just really nice. Um, yeah. you know, my 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 wife and her kind of hit it off a little bit when we were. Oh. In, Vegas a few years ago watching the show, you know, and, and Cindy was out and, and, uh, and my wife just, I just love her. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah no, it was, they're, they're, they're just great people. I mean, that's praise indeed. I mean, Carlos Santana, I mean, he's had so many great tones over the years. What a player. I mean, I know. And kind of thing that's constantly, quite like constantly evolving. Yeah. Constantly evolving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the yeah, early he, stuff, the tone on his great. early stuff is great. The tone on the later stuff is great. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Wow, what mm -hmm. a cool, brilliant. That's exciting. Yeah, he's, I, yeah. I mean, he's he's been a guitar hero as long as I've known there, there was guitars. I mean, oh, man. Yeah, you know, I, yeah. I, I saw him, I saw him at the state fairgrounds in my hometown the year after, oh, it was the year after Stevie Ray Vaughan died. Right. Um, and it was, I believe the show was on either the day before or the day of uh, Stevie Ray's death. And um, it was a cool show. It was, uh, you know, in the early 90s, I was, I think I was in middle school at the time. Um, you know, I'm 43. So I think I was in middle school at the time, uh, maybe a freshman in high school, or, you know, first year in high school. And uh, Fish was on tour with them, uh, with Santana, and wow. they played the call. They played the Colorado State Fairgrounds in Pueblo, Colorado. 
uh, which is not a major venue uh, <laughs> at all. It, you know, it's a, it's a rodeo arena. And, right. uh, um, but it had rained all day and we were so worried they were going to cancel the show and it stopped raining. Um, and, uh, you know, fish came out and of course the, their following was there. And, you know, the, my hometown had never seen such a thing, you know, all the, all the, all the, the you know, the, the people dancing in the mud. You know? Woodstock. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was, it was Woodstock. It was, it yeah. was Woodstock. And, you know, I, I was just a kid. I thought, oh, wow, that's really cool. And, you know, the fish, you know, the guy was playing a vacuum cleaner on his face. I had never seen such a thing, you know, <laughs> it, I mean, I'd never heard of fish, um, you know, maybe 1992, 91. I, I don't remember exactly the year. But, uh, and of course, you know, Carlos comes out and he starts playing and, and you know, played some hits. And then he, he took a minute to talk about Stevie Ray. And, and uh, he started playing uh, one of the slow ones off Spirits Dancing in the Flesh. And by the third note, the sky started pouring rain. Look at my arms, man. <laughs> the hair is standing up on my arms like that was the moment that carlos santana was my guy you yeah. Know? Like, yeah, yeah like wow you know it was just, it was just a magical moment for me yeah. you know yeah. and, and, and being a kid like it, it was it was a magical moment oh i loved him so, when I was a kid. that live out yeah oh, was he called moonflower is that what it's called i, I think it was a yeah, dog. oh man i loved that mm -hmm. yeah. oh, axis great great records oh man mm -hmm. fantastic I'm gonna to have to go yeah. back to YouTube and check out Carlos is playing the last few years. Now. Yeah, his oh, uh, my my favorite Carlos is um, Blues for Salvador. Right, uh, I don't know. That. Which right. is, it, you know, it's funny. It sounds dated now because there's a lot of uh, like Yamaha keyboard sounds on it. Yeah, but it's it's just got fire. Like yeah. the whole album, it's just fire. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. he's he's just he's playing he's playing his ass off. He's connected to something else, isn't he? He's tuned into something else, I think. Cool. Yes, yes. He, he, um, yeah, he's, you know, he exists on a different plane from you and me. <laughs> so talking to people on a different plane, I've got to do it. I mean, I did, I did warn you, but um, yeah, the question that the, the Dumble Geeks that I know, no offense to you guys, if you're watching. Uh, I work without, without well, again, as I said, what, without asking you to reveal any trade secrets, could you tell us about, um, well, your relationship with Larry Colton, but also making his amp on, about that process? You know, um, it was funny. Uh, so I have a friend in Connecticut, and he's a retired postman. And he is the person who introduced me to your buddy, John, uh, yeah. John Harrington. Yeah, yeah. He introduced me to Larry Carlton. Uh, or via Rick Wheeler, um, you know, I, like I know all of these people through my friend Kenny in Connecticut, and how Kenny knows these people is still beyond me. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was it was just a there was just a coincidence. Uh, Larry Carlton and Robin Ford were doing their show. You know, they did that album together, and they were uh, on tour, and they were coming through Boulder. And uh, I called Kenny and I said, hey, Kenny, you know, see, see if you can get a hold of Rick. I want to see if these guys will listen to my amps. And Rick, uh, who was teching for Larry and, and uh, Robin at the time, is just the nicest guy in the world. I mean, we're, we're just good buddies. You know, I, I, I love him to death like a brother. You know, like he's just the greatest guy. And uh, Rick agreed. You know, he said, well, you know bring them on by, come around back and uh, I'll give them a listen. If I think it's worthwhile, the guys will listen to them. And, you know, I brought a few and, and uh, he played through them and he's like, wow, you know, these are really nice. I'll, I'll, I'll have the guys play through them. And, you know, uh, Robin played first and he was very complimentary of it. And then Larry played it and he was very complimentary of it. And, and uh, you know, and they, they said, Hey, you know, Larry's Larry's Dumble actually uh, his his backup Dumble uh, died uh, last show, and so we sent it back to Nashville to get fixed. Um, can he use yours tonight as a backup? Yeah, of course, Larry Carlton <laughs> can use my amp, you know, on, on the stage as a backup. And so they're doing sound check, and um, they get done with sound check, and they start sort of cutting heads, Larry and Robin, back and forth. But it wasn't really cutting heads like 
like you think of like a shred contest like it was like a weird noise contest that they were doing like like just making like horse whinnies and all kinds of weird stuff back and forth at each other it was it was pretty comical and, and larry comes up like pete townsend you know and comes down and makes this foghorn honk like a like a tugboat <laughs> kind of thing and then pff, smoke pours out of the back of the stumble and uh you know there's all you know everybody's gathered around and looking at it and you know i'm in the audience just watching the the, the show at this you know, this the sound check at this point and um you know guy pulls it out he says well it doesn't look like the fuse is blown and and of course you know the tech in me light goes off ding 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 hey don't turn that back on you know like if smoke came out don't turn it back on and you know and so i i kind of run up there to you know stop them from you know hurting it worse basically uh you know by turning it back on and you know they all kind of look up at me like can you fix it uh, <laughs> so, uh yes i can fix it but i didn't bring anything i came to see a show you know <laughs> so i here i am backstage at the at the boulder theater i've got larry carlton's dumble open in front of me um inside of it um and of course it's a very simple repair it's you know it's uh, uh hum balance resistors which is very common repair in tube amps you know the hum balance resistors like it blows a tube they take out those resistors smoke comes out it's very common repair and so well can you you know i need the following things to fix this and you know so I need a soldering iron i need some solder um and a few other things and you say well we have a soldering iron we have solder um you know we don't we don't have the resistors and things like that well can you send a runner to radio shack so they sent a runner to radio shack and i knew that radio shack carried these 100 ohm resistors because i bought them there at a pinch so we sent a runner to radio shack he comes back with all this stuff and i'm literally fixing an amplifier with tweezers and an emery board from my wife's purse to like clean the leads and the the soot off the parts and um you know get it all soldered up and i said okay well we just need a new quad of tubes and i said well here you go and they handed me 5081s well the thing about larry's amps at the time is they used the sovtech 5881 which is a very different tube from the tung 5881 and his amps run ran really really high internal voltages at the time like really high and it would have melted these other ones you know the right. the, the russian the, the russian military tube the sovtech 5881 it's not actually a 5081 um i have some with the russian cyrillic labels on them downstairs that actually came from russia but it's a, it's a military grade tube and it has a completely different spec sheet but it just so happens it works in fender you know <laughs> so um right. but uh so that that tube will take the you know 700 or so volts that this amp runs on, on the plates and this other one wouldn't and they said well you know the amp is fixed all you need is is to get the right tubes and, and bias it um you know your next show's in salt lake i'm sure there's some place in salt lake that has a quad i've already exhausted every place because by now it's seven o'clock you yeah. know and uh, and the show starts at eight or nine and I've, I've exhausted everybody I can think of to call to get a set of the right tubes there for the show. Um, and, you know, there's there's nobody left to call uh, in, in town that would have a quad of these tubes. I didn't have a quad of them. Um, uh, my buddy who's a repair tech, he had a quad, but he had some place else he had to be, so he couldn't do it. Um, you know, I, I, I exhausted every possibility that I could. I just said, you know, I, I don't have the right tubes. And he said, well, how about this? why don't you take the dumble home and fix it and we'll take your amp and finish the tour and then when the tour's done we'll swap back I wow. said, are you kidding <laughs> of course of course <laughs> wow okay. yeah so you know we did we did the swap back and then you know rick called me later and said you know larry'd really like to really like to get one of, one of your amps and uh you know he'd like you to um <clears throat> He, they sent me his his favorite of his two dumbbells and they said well you know kind of start here and um you know and then we'll you know we'll, we'll, we'll tweak it as necessary so you know the first one was basically just sort of a a, a copy ish of of the first one you know using you know modern era parts and over the years we've you know we've tweaked it just a little bit or i've tweaked it for him based on you know things that he's told me that you know I, I never hear from him unless there's something not working right. right. So I always assume no news is good news. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. you know, 
you know, occasionally things go down or something like that. It's, you know, the low end kind of gets away from me a little bit on this one. So we make a little tweak and, you know, we tighten up the low end on that one. And, you know, I think he has, I want to say he has five, maybe six of them. Um, right. And yeah, he stashes them. You know, he stashes them around the world. He keeps, you know, keeps one in uh, continental Europe and one in the UK and got one in the, one in the US, he keeps one in Japan. Uh, he's right. got one for his studio. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a way to do it. Transportation costs are expensive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I tell you what, I did, um, I, um, I used to, actually, I've got a column coming up with them again. I used to write for, and I'm just about to start writing for Guitar Techniques magazine over here. And I did an interview with Larry in Nashville. Nice. Quite a few nice. years ago, actually. And he was using, mm -hmm. we we just met up, you know, you know, they do that thing in Nashville where people get together and write little, little rooms, they call them writing studios, but it's just a room somewhere, quiet, you know. So he, he, he borrowed this place that he uses to write with some people. And he turned up with like a, what is it? Not a Princeton, some little tweed thing. Not yeah, a, right? a, a, it's a deluxe. That's it. That's it. Yeah, I think uh -huh. it's it. Um, oh man, I mean the tone that guy gets out of his hands is just. Yeah. Oh, that's all the Steely Dan. All the Steely Dan was that little amp, that right. very one he probably bought. You you witnessed all of the great Steely Dan tones came from that little amplifier right. in that three thirty five. Well, um, I mean, what, a what, time. what that, what that man can squeeze from nothing blows my mind. I mean, yeah. it, Larry just drips tone. <laughs> like he, he I mean, exudes, it, man. He exudes it from his pores. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's as a, as a musician, he's like, he's got all that sort of jazz harmonic knowledge and melodic knowledge, but he's got the, that blues touch like a great, great yeah. blues player. Man, I thought that's probably the best guest best guitar tone I've ever heard. Is mm. him just right in front of me, ringing. The yeah. Note. I had a thing today. I did some teaching this morning. I've got a student, he's a degree student. He's a, he's a really talented young lad. And I thought, I'm going to blow your mind today. I think it was probably because I was thinking I was going to be seeing you later. Uh, I mean, I love Larry Carlton's playing, but I did um, just a little bit of the the intro to Don't Take Me Alive. Mm -hmm. So oh, I just thought it was dirty double stops for the style he does and the bending with the index finger and liquid kind of oh man i love larry Gordon. what a player oh, he just he he sees things harmonically that that are beyond most people like he he tries to explain it well he does explain it he explains it well i just don't yeah. grasp it um <laughs> <laughs> and he's he's such a nice guy too yeah. you know he's 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 a person that you can just just talk about stuff with you know like yeah. i i try not to talk about music when i when i have a chance to you know have a conversation with lc you know, talk, talk about anything but guitar or music because he's just he's just a great guy you know yeah. he's just, and he's fun and he's, he's he's pretty funny you know he's got yeah, yeah. Nice, uh, dry sense of humor and, yeah yeah um you know, I, I got an opportunity when I brought him his first amplifier. Um, he invited me and my wife to come out to uh, uh, Summerlin, which is near Las Vegas, Summerlin, Nevada. They have casinos there. But he, I don't know if he still does it, but he had a, a yearly thing where he'd do a three day stint there. And, and uh, he invited my wife out. And so it was a lot of fun. We got to you know, really, really spend some time and have dinner. And I, I got to meet his mom. I mean, wow. <laughs> wow. yeah, yeah, just super nice lady. And, and uh, it, it was just, it was good times. It was good times. And of course, his son, Travis is, great is a great guy too. Great yeah, oh, he's, he's yeah, yeah. just unbelievable player. Yeah. Um, but you know, super nice guy. And, um, I just feel honored that I, I, I get to like know these people and, and you know, count them among like friends, you know, well, it's kind uh, of natural. You make beautiful, beautiful apps, you know, it's, it's yeah, such an know, important thing, you know, you know, it's always that it's, 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 it's always that sort of, uh, you know, artists, uh, uh, what is, what is the word I'm looking for? You, know, you kind of get down on yourself, you know, like, oh, yeah. I'm not good at this. And, yeah. Know, it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad people like them. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you kind of have to, you've got to be hard on yourself to be good at anything, haven't you, you know? Yeah, you know, just, it's a constant struggle to always figure out a way to make it better. 
you know, always, you know, improve it, improve the tone in some way. You know, like I like yeah. to think that I like to think that each one I build is better than the last one. Um, you know, it was a good aspiration. So here's a question. And as somebody who lives over the pond, I mean, mm -hmm. if I was going to buy one of your heads, there's no way I could justify getting a cab shipped over. So have you, do you kind of say, say somebody like me or anybody buys an, a head from you? Do you right. kind of try and guide them as to what sort of speakers and what sort of cab to use if they're going to um, use? Yeah, the if they cab? don't. Um, to be honest with you, uh, it's not really that much more to ship it. Unless you're talking about like a 412. A 412 is brutal to ship. But a 112 or a 212 is not really that expensive is that right? to ship really? along with a head. Um, the ship, well, the shipping to Australia is expensive anyway from from Denver, Colorado. I mean, right. I, I want to say it's, oh, I, I've got a, I've got a program that I use for international shipping uh, through, through the shipping company I use. And it's one of these things where you can call a different hotline and get a special rate on planes going out that are not full. Right. But you have to have exact dimensions and ship that day. So, um, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, regular rate, I think, to ship a head to Australia right now is probably six hundred bucks. I would imagine. Well, I mean, I'm in the UK. I'm in the UK. So. Oh, you're in the UK. Yeah, For yeah, some yeah. reason, I thought you were in Australia. Uh, yeah. I, I think, you know, uh, at, at the time, I haven't shipped one to you, the UK uh, recently, but I've shipped heads and cabs to the UK, and it's it's not really that much more to ship the cab. But, you yeah. know, if you have a, a cabinet builder, you know. <laughs> potentially give you cabinet dimensions or oh, something okay. like that it's no, you know it's uh, speakers i can always recommend speakers you know yeah. for for people but um you know they go by dimensional weight and so it, it starts going down exponentially the more boxes you ship so oh okay you know, it, i like the sound it, of that it, yeah it's it's not as it's not as bad to you know to to ship a, the cabinet by itself and then to ship the head by itself is expensive but to ship them both at the same time the price doesn't go up that much. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, sure. Of course, you know, right now everything's crazy. You know, there's yeah. there's nothing there's nothing that you can count on that that it's been the way it's been in the past as far yeah. as shipping rates and, and things like that. Because, well, there are also you know, um, in, import tariffs as well. There's all sorts of things going. Yeah. On. Have you suffered yeah, that at all? Uh, not so much. Right. Not so much right. with the with the import tariffs. Um, you know, most of what I purchase here in the U.S., I, I buy from distributors. So it's already, you know, prices have gone up on things. But, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the with the with the export tariffs and, and stuff like that. Uh, oh, I bought a Duesenberg lap steel and uh, I actually got it cheaper buying it in London than I did buying it here with wow. shipping duties and everything i i say four or five hundred dollars buying it from a shop in london that i would have buying it this side wow yeah that's yeah. wild crazy it is wild <laughs> it's wild but uh you know he had a bunch and, and and he was willing to give a good price and of course uh you know no vat because it's coming over here and, yeah and uh you know we don't really pay import duties here the way that unfortunately the you know you guys have to in europe um, yeah. in the uk it's punishing uh, it's punishing yeah they they just don't assess them like that here um it's really pretty reasonable to import guitars yeah. and amplifiers and, yeah. and things like that um canada there's a lot of paperwork to ship to canada right, okay. <laughs> yeah. um but uh well we had the nafta i don't know if that's even still in effect anymore uh or if there's something that replaced it but you know uh, we had the north american free trade agreement so as long as it was made in the usa and going to canada there was no should be no duties on it as long as you fill out the appropriate paperwork yeah so, yeah uh, always a lot of paperwork to ship stuff to Canada, but you know, if it saves them the duties, it's worth it. Yeah, you know? sure. Yeah, sure. Here's a question for you. Taking a, another left turn. If Jimi Hendrix was alive, what blue dot mm -hmm. would he buy? Well, I'd hope the South Saturn Delta since that's biggest, the one I named. Biggest, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, I, that of the, of the questions, that you know that's the one that i've given the most thought to because what would jimmy hendrix be doing today you know if it, 
I, would he still be playing guitar? You know, would would he be on to something else? You know, would he be uh, uh, would would he have been canonized in the way that he was if if he hadn't died? That's true. You yeah. know, I mean, he's a, he was an epic player, one of my absolute favorites of all yeah. time. Oh yeah. Um, you know, uh, just uh, just amazing. You know, but would would it, would he have burned out on playing the guitar? Would he have? You know, would he be still making amazing things today? Yeah. Uh, had he not passed away, or, or or would he even still be playing music? <laughs> you yeah, know? exactly. No, um, you're, you're right. Yeah. It, it's 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 such a loaded. I mean, you'd you'd like to think that you know Jimi Hendrix would have continued to just you know uh uh escalate you just just become greater and greater and greater and greater yeah. and you know and, yeah. and, and in the realm of those things of course i would love if he played one of my south saturn deltas because you know it's even though it doesn't really sound that Jimi hendrixy it, it, i named it in honor of him yeah you know, sure yes yeah. You know, yeah uh i mean uh, i'd love that you know he'd, he'd probably like the joy use a little bit better but maybe not you know yeah. uh, i mean what what would Jimi hendrix play if he was alive today everything he could get his hands on i think sure yeah he would have had you know, every, you know, yeah yeah every possible thing he could get his hands on but i i of course would be absolutely honored if he played <laughs> you know one of mine i mean gee whiz you know what uh, what kind of an honor would that be you know? I mean, <laughs> or, to, uh, to, or to even have five minutes with the guy you oh know my. just just yeah. just to just to talk to him for five minutes just I to mean. hear that sound i mean i know a lot of people have saw him wow. play, and it's like um oh, band of gypsies is oh that's one of my oh, um, so good man. all of it so good yeah all of it is so good um they, uh, there's no bad Jimi hendrix you know yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, the I mean, thing there's no there's no bad Hendrix. There's, You're right, aren't you? I mean, good. because he was only famous and producing albums under his own steam for a few years. Every single tune has been pulled apart, hasn't it? So people have covered nearly every single one of his tunes. Yes. Which you're right. If he'd lived further, who knows how that would have gone? Maybe he'd have lost a bit of focus. Maybe not. I imagine not. But I mean, he was too, he was a friend of Miles Davis. I wonder if mm -hmm. he would have gone down that. Yeah, yeah. I think they, they were planning yeah. to do something together or they're thinking it might have come to pass. That would have been interesting. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to think about what could have been, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it was a, a tremendous loss, but um, it's, 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 it's a lot of fun to think about, you know, um, uh, write books about it, write movies about it. You absolutely, know? absolutely. Like the, what was the, what was the movie uh, where the Beatles never existed? Did you ever see that one? Oh, it, where the guy last... written, written their tunes. Is that, that film, is that the one you're thinking of? That some yeah, guy, he, only, just... he remembers, he remembers the Beatles tunes and yeah. nobody else does. Yeah. He, yeah. I, yeah, he actually ends up going and meeting, meeting John Lennon who lives in this simple little cottage yeah, and yeah, like, yeah. on the beach and you know, I was like, what, what would have become, you know, it's, it's hard to say, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's hard. To, we, we don't, of course, all love to believe that, you know, all of these amazing guitarists that have been taken from us uh, would have continued to go on and, and just become greater and greater and greater. And, you know, that's, mm. um, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's a wonderful thought. <laughs> I should, I should let you get back to making fantastic amplifiers but thanks so much for taking the time to chat it's hey i'm happy to do it i i, I man I, I i i'm really honored that you wanted to interview me oh man <laughs> i don't know i mean honestly i mean it, 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 it's it's a strange thing with the, with the guitar in, the, the amp and guitar industry that we're most people are buying gear based on some guy's demo on youtube but as I say, some of these demos, there's, there's this one. I, I I wish I could remember the young guy's name because he he's a, a good player. This guy, it's like oh, this kid is making this thing sound like something you've got to have. Was it, was it one of my videos? No, no, I think this is a young guy just showing what you weren't in. You weren't featured in it, definitely. I wish I could remember. Oh, okay. Guy. But um, that's some one of my point is for something to come through a video recorded on a mobile phone and sound like that's it. <laughs> well, I, I was dying to dying to catch up with you and uh yeah i mean i got in touch with john harrington as a mind if i drop your name with this guy just because you're gonna think i'm a lunatic wanted to do an interview but anyway. oh, i love john 
John's great. <laughs> what a musician. He's, he's great. A, very smart guy. Oh, Lovely guy. He's just, a, he's just a great, I mean, aside from being a great, great musician, he's just a great guy. You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. He, he's just a great guy. Like, he's a, yeah. He came, he came to my shop to pick up one of his amps and uh, they were playing downtown and uh, he absolutely insisted on taking the train down to down to where I live and having me pick him up at the stop rather than I was just going to drive downtown and pick him up. And he insisted on taking the train. Bless him. Wow. Okay, well, I live in New York. I take the train all the time. Yeah. Said, well, it's, you know, this is a much safer train here. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just, I, I just, I, it, it, it blows my mind when I meet you because you know I've met a few people who are a little bit arrogant, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. and and I always love when I meet guys that aren't, you know, and and it kind of seems like the the more real the people are, the more real the their playing is too. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, like John. I mean, John's an amazing. Player. He's an very he, amazing player. Yeah. He, he I, I took some videos, uh, but I've never done anything with him. He said I could post them, but uh, I never have. But some videos of him playing a little J Rod amp that I built him with uh, a guitar that my buddy Mike built. It's sort of a, it was sort of a take on the Robin Ford Esprit, but with different woods, a slightly different shape. Uh, you know, the carved spruce top, so it's like a hollow guitar, but it didn't have any F holes in it, right. and it's about as thick as a Les Paul. Right. Um, he got these Barney Kessel pull winners era tones out of this guitar and this like it was Marshall. I mean, what I built him was was basically like a plexi with a built-in uh, buffered effects loop, and he was coaxing this 1950s 1960s jazz goodness yeah, yeah. out of it, and yeah. I was just like, man, like what a great player. And he, you know, he, he like showed me how to play a few Steely Dan tunes. <laughs> he's so, he's just so nice. I was like, you know, and I was just goofing on him too. I was like, hey, you know, show, show me how to play everything you did, you know? And it's like, oh, yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like, just, wow, you know, what a great dude. Well, I got, I got John to do a workshop for my students, like an online clinic thing. And I transcribed a couple That's of things cool. to show these young guys. Mm -hmm. some of his stuff from his solo albums if you haven't checked them out there's some killer killer playing some great songs you know he's a great sort of band leader singer yeah songwriter as well very great musician very very creative it's really something yeah yeah, yeah. He, he really is he's a, he's a very very talented guy listen man i'm gonna let you i'm gonna let you do your work it's so kind of you to take the time to do this and happy to do it man yeah. um, maybe I'm a christmas by, humbled by the opportunity so. maybe at christmas you could give my wife a ring and have a conversation with her about you know finances but you bet but we'll come back you to bet. it that'll be an interesting <laughs> conversation i think but uh one day oh yes one day it will be mine thank you so much brandon anytime uh, all the best man and, and i'll send you, you a link too. to this when it comes out which is in a few days great thanks thanks man all the best see you Take soon care. Cheers, man. Bye-bye. It's time for Amja.